much, uh, Rabbi Koskas, and uh, of course, Rabbi Kobe, who uh, facilitated this uh, talk tonight. Uh, I'd also like to say a um, hello to, uh, well, our actual connection to your special Makam Torah, our children, Tana, Tal, and Hannah alone. And a special hello as well to my good friend, Moshe Weisman, uh, if, if uh, you are tuned in. Uh, my friends, needless to say, as was just mentioned, it, uh, it is unprecedented uh, what we are going through, uh, even what we are hearing from the greatest rabbis of the generation have all voiced the same idea. It, uh, it's absolutely unprecedented uh, in history. And uh, any way you turn, basically, we have people who, uh, who are suffering in one way or another, if it's not health-wise, uh, then it is financially, uh, families are separated, of course, uh, and uh, we tried the best we can to endure what Hashem has decided is uh, the best for us, as we will hopefully learn tonight. Um, I'd like to dedicate tonight's talk for a schus, a merit, uh, for all those who require a for shalema, a speedy recovery, good health, harnasa, and uh, all the quote-unquote normal things in life. Although it is, as we just mentioned, unprecedented and people are suffering, yet we are mandated by our rabbis to be happy, even under these circumstances. As we say in our prayers in our davening every morning, Ivdu as Hashem v'simcha, serve Hashem v'simcha, with happiness. Uh, even during the month of Av, uh, during the summer month, uh, the month in which the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, Yerushalayim was destroyed, as the halacha states, ad, When the month of Av comes, we minimize the amount of Simcha. The halacha doesn't say we don't have Simcha. The Beis Hamidrash is destroyed. Millions of people are murdered. Jews suffered left and right. Yet, the halacha states, We never rid ourselves of Simcha completely. So we must be happy. So how does one stay happy, even under these circumstances? So I'd like to start with something which, uh, don't get too nervous, uh, but a few years ago, I landed myself in jail. Um, like I say, don't get nervous, because uh, Baruch Hashem, I was on the right side of the bars. Uh, I had been invited to speak to Jewish prisoners in the uh, South Bay Correctional Center, which is about a two hour drive from here in Miami. And uh, you're wondering, what do you say to these inmates uh, who are there for different infractions? You have those who are sitting there for a year or two, five years, 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, there were three inmates who were going to sit for life terms, committed murder. And yet, what do you say to be machazek, to strengthen, to uh, give these people a feeling that, yes, even under those circumstances, one can still be happy. Uh, so I, I reached out to Hashem, of course, that he put the right words in my mouth. And uh, I decided to do something really rather simple. Um, I started off with asking them a question. What does the average person in the world want out of life? Out of the seven billion plus people on the face of the earth, what does the average person want? And one of the prisoners raised their hand, they said, money. Another one raised his hand and said, pleasure. Finally, the third inmate raised his hand and he said, the average person on the face of the earth wants happiness. And he explained, he said, even those people who want money, it's because they think money will bring them happiness. And even those people who want pleasure, it's also because they think the pleasure will bring them happiness. But ultimately he said, and he explained it very nicely, that the average person just wants to be happy. So how do we get happy? So I decided to share with them a paragraph, just one paragraph in a safer called Orcho Sadikim. It's a safer, a Musa safer, a safer that was uh, written actually by an unknown author, uh, late 1300s which probably makes him a Rishon. And it's a, it's a safer, it's a book that uh, helps people um, improve and correct their character. And in one of the chapters, Shara Simcha, 
actually, in the gate of happiness, there is one paragraph which stands out. And I'd like to share that paragraph with you, we'll read it first, and then we'll go through step by step. And with Hashem's help, it will help us to develop and strengthen our happiness, even in the times that we find ourselves now. Let me read it to you. The manner in which a person can be happy with his portion. That he would be able to accept the simcha with happiness, the fortunate and the unfortunate, the good and the bad. That is the short one line introduction to the secret he's about to share with us. He says this way, the way for a person to be happy with this portion and the way for a person to be happy with the bad as good as the good is divided into four categories. In other words, he's about to offer us a very special recipe, a recipe for happiness that has only four ingredients. The first ingredients, one requires great bitachon, trust in Hashem. Hashniya, the second ingredient, is Hayamuna, belief in Hashem. And of course, we'll have to understand the difference between the two, trust and belief. Hashlishis, the third item, is Haseichel, which often is translated as common sense, but we'll find that that it doesn't mean common sense, it means it's an intellect and what exactly intellect is. We will find that hopefully. And finally, number four, Haravia is his tapkos, contentment that a person needs to learn to be content with whatever he has in life. So let's take one step at a time. In the introduction to the ingredients, he used the words, she yismach ha'adam bechelko, that a person needs to be happy not with his lot as some of the English translations say from the word his portion and the truth of the matter is one of the great rabbis says that a person should learn how to be happy with his portion because at the end of life everybody ends up only with a portion of what they really wanted anyway so might as well adjust to being happy with a portion but what does that mean, being happy with your portion? This brings us to a very famous machloket, a difference of opinion, with a word that many people throw around. The word ashir, rich. You see, there is a difference of opinion between a Mishnah Pirkei Avot, authored by Ben Zoma. He says, Eze hu ashir, famous Mishnah, what is the definition of an ashir, someone who was happy with their portion? That is a very different opinion than the famous dictionary Merriam-Webster. If you look up the word in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, rich, R-I-C-H, you see that he defines it, or it is defined as someone who amassed much money and property. Very different opinion between of course, Miriam Webster and Benzoma, the Mishnah in Perkyovos. What does the Mishnah really say? The Mishnah says, and I quote it to you Who is considered an Ashir, one who is happy with this portion? I'd like to share a Teferis Yisrael with you, absolutely amazing. One of the commentaries on the bottom of a regular Mishnah says as follows. Dahavi Yadua Nami, uh, I'm sorry, Dahavi Yadua, it is well known that the Pharisee Israel is teaching us a lesson in human nature. It is well known, Demisha Hissik Hatachlis, that a person who sets out to attain, to reach a certain goal and reaches that goal, whatever the goal may be. Tov Yose may also Shalohi Sigo is better off than a person who has not reached the goal. The Imkain, and if that's the case, if a person sets out to attain a certain goal, and he decides to be happy, to be content 
with whatever it is that he attains, even if it's ma'at, even if it's a, a little bit. And he has reached his goal. I will also say, you know, this topic, but if a person uh, never learns to be happy with what he accomplished, with what he reached, so he will never reach his goal. And he never in the, his life will ever reach his goal. He will remain forever a poor person. Why the harem is yagel atachlis shelo yasigel? Because he is toiling for a goal that is unreachable. You see, only if a person we're working on that goal, whatever the goal may be, and he decides to be happy, so to be happy with that goal that he has reached, then no matter what it is that he has reached, that he has attained, he'll be happy. Because his decision was to be happy with whatever goal he reached. But if a person is not happy with his portion, then whatever he is that he attained will never be enough. Because he decided that he is not happy with what he reached, he wants more. So that explains beautifully what is meant by <clears throat> the wealthy person, or should I say the rich person, is truly the person who is happy with what he has. Now, please understand, my friends, that richness comes in very different forms. Often we think of richness in terms of dollars and cents. I can tell you without mentioning a name of someone here in our community years ago who is a Baal Tzedakah, a charitable person of the highest degree, regularly does not only give Meister tenth of his income, but gives 20%, a Chomish. And he always gave a Chomish. And then one day he took a killing on the stock market. It troubled him how Hashem did that to him. Here is a person who gives so much tzedakah. It troubled him enough that he sent that question that he had, this troubling fact, uh, with a, a friend of his who had access to Rabbi Yosha, the great Rabbi Yosha, Sukhana Lebracha, the Posek of Yerushalayim. And the question was, why would Hashem do that to him? What about Aser Bishvil Shetis Asher? We know there's a famous um, uh, statement by the rabbis, if somebody gives Meiser, he will become an Ashir, become uh, rich, wealthy. Here he gives a chom he gives a homish. What happened to the guarantee? And Rabbi Yosher's response was, wealth comes in different forms. Does he have a wife who is healthy? Does he have children who are healthy? His family is healthy. Then he has his wealth. Health, yes, is wealth. How many of us, as we age, of course, when as youngsters, we always thought about material things, but as we get older, we realize, and especially during our days now, where we appreciate what true wealth is if we have our health. The second part of the introduction in the Oracle Sadiqim was she akabel besimcha hara kamohatov, that a person accepts with happiness the bad as good as the good. This is based on a well-known Mishnah in uh, Mesech the Barachos. Here is the wording, A person is obligated to bless Hashem for the bad, as well as he blesses Hashem for the good. Listen to the words of the commentary part, Tanura, when a person has to make the God forbid somebody passes on. He has to say that blessing. He has to recite those words. With happiness and a good heart. With the same joy and happiness as he makes the bracha when he says hatov hametiv. My friends, the bracha tov hametiv is made when a new child is born, if the husband is there by the bedside, and a baby is born, they say, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alom atov hametiv. The God who is good and does good. Imagine the happiness, the thrill of having a new child. The simcha, the joy, the enthusiasm that that bracha is made. And here the Bartanura is saying that the Mishnah is teaching us 
just as that enthusiasm came across in the bracha tovamitiv, the same enthusiasm has to be made when we say the bracha baruch dayan ha'emes. Blessed is the dayan ha'emes, the true judge of someone, God forbid, passes away. The toast was yomtiv, one of the other commentators, asked the obvious question, how is it possible? How can we expect a human being to say the bracha baruch dayan ha'emes with the same joy, same happiness as he says the bracha atov ha'metiv? And quoting the Pirish Shamishnayas al Rambam, the commentary of the Rambam, Maimonides' commentary on the Mishnah, the Rambam explains the reason we have a hard time with it is because we, in our myopic vision, think that what's good is good and what's bad is bad. If we only understood in the big picture what's good could be bad and what's bad could be good, then we wouldn't have a problem saying the brachas with the same enthusiasm. And because who knows Hashem's ways? Who knows if what the quote-unquote bad news now is really bad? That's why it's so important, my friends, not to mix up these two words which happen to rhyme with one another. We use the word bad. Let's use the word sad. Yes, there are situations in life like the ones we are going through now that are sad. But far be it from us to call it bad. In Hashem's vocabulary, there is no such thing as bad. I want to share an incident that I heard in the name of Rabbi Beryl Wein, may he be gesund, the famous Rov historian. One of his balabatim had asked the stockbroker to make a big investment to buy many stocks in General Motors. General Motors at that time had a reputation of going sky high. Mistakenly, the stockbroker, for some strange reason, instead of investing all that money in GM, invested the money in GE, General Electric, which had a terrible reputation at that time. Imagine the feeling of this customer when he finds out that the stockbroker took all his money and basically threw it away. Lo and behold, a day or two later, the strangest turn of events, which even the experts didn't understand. GM General Motors plummeted and GE, General Electric, skyrocketed, and he made a fortune of money. So here we have a situation where it looks, it appears that it's terrible, throwing away money. Yet in Hashem's world, there is no such thing as the word bad. Now that brings us to the actual ingredients, the four ingredients that are the recipe for happiness. The number one ingredient was bitachon, trust. Now, please trust me on this one. The truth of the matter is the only real way to understand with great depth this midah, this character trait of bitachon, of trust in Hashem, is to do an in-depth study in the, in the uh, book, in the Sefer Chovos HaVovos, written by Rabbeinu Bachaya, in the Shar HaBitachon, the chapter that discusses bitachon. That is really the real way to do it. But we'll do the best we can under the circumstances. Number one, I want to mention that I had consulted, I had asked my Rosh Hashiva, Zerkon Al-Racha, Rabbi Hanach Libowitz, with the Rashiva, the Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim Yeshiva. I had asked him a very pointed question once. I said, you consult with so many people through the years, thousands. He was a Rosh Hashiva for over 60 years. And so many people come to you with, your problem, with their problems, with their issues. I know you're a very smart man, but how many answers can you come up with to consult these people to help them? And he told me something with Che, which changed my life. He said, it's really very easy. Every single problem that a person experiences in life is either a lack of humility or because of a lack of bitach and trust in Hashem. And then he added, even a lack of humility is also a lack of bitach and trust in Hashem. The only trick is, to unco- is to uncover how this person's particular challenge and problem stems back to either one of those two and ultimately, like we said, to a lack of bitachon. So the bottom line is, it's all up to bitachon. Trust in Hashem is what it's all about. Yes, even the times that we're going through now, even for those prisoners sitting behind bars, if a person works on his trust, on his trust in his bitachon and Hashem, Yes, that could bring him happiness. Let's take it to the next level. 
all present company excluded. But if you have anybody who has any stress in their life, please share the following thought with them. It is a game changer. Should I say it is a life changer? Stress, a dirty word. More often than not, it's connected to money. You ever, have you ever noticed that the word stress has two S's in it? Or should I say it has three S's in it? Put a line through each one, money, money, money. Stress, my friends, has nothing to do with what we do. Stress is only the result of what we do. Let me explain what I mean. About 15 years ago in the United States of America, a survey was taken, what are the three most stressful things in a person's life? It may be amusing to you. Number one was going to the dentist, very stressful. Number two, filling out your tax returns. Number three, was a housewife preparing dinner for her family. The study showed that a woman wakes up in the morning, the first thing in her mind, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, is what is for dinner. Now, let me ask you, my friends, what's causing us stress? Is this the slicing and the dicing the tomatoes in the kitchen? The recipes she's using? She's an expert. She's doing it for 15, 20, 25 years. She makes delicious food. Where is the stress? Not what she's doing, not the actions that she is performing. But will my family be happy? Ah, that's a result of her actions. That has nothing to do with her actions. She can do the greatest job in the world. If for some reason or another, Hashem decides that her family will not be happy, they won't be happy. She can mess up terribly, on the other hand. If Hashem decides that they should be happy, they're going to be happy. When the surgeon goes to the surgery room, to the operating room, what is giving him stress? Where to put the scalpel? No, he's experienced. He's doing this for 25 years. Where's the stress? Will the patient survive? Ah, that is a result. Once a person recognizes that the only thing I have control of are my actions, what I do, and the results of my actions are up to Hashem, I have absolutely no control over it then I rid myself of stress because the stress only came from the results and the results are out of my hands anyway. So once I leave the results alone, I rid myself of the stress. Now I know it sounds very easy and it's a lifetime's work, but basically that's what it's all about. In fact, examine the Loshan HaKodesh, the Hebrew word for stress, da'aga. Dalit Aleph Gimel Heid is the first letters of the Aleph Beis, missing one letter, the Beis, Bitachon. Insert the Beis or Bitachon in that word and you break, you shatter Daga, you shatter stress, you get rid of the stress. If we leave out the Beis for Bitachon, we don't include it, then we're left with Daga. You see, the problem is we live in a bottom line society. A society which is only concerned with the bottom line. You work for a company, they really don't care how much you work during the week or every day. They want to know at the end of the period, are we making money or not? And when I'm making money, you get fired. Bottom line society. Well, we believe something very differently. We believe, and this is a very important phrase to remember, plans are men's, but the odds are God's. Let's remember as well that bitocho means that the manufacturer knows the product more than anyone else. It's obvious. If something goes wrong with your iPhone and it has to be repaired, the best place to take it is to Apple. Imagine you walk in there to Apple and you ask the guy behind the counter, would you mind if I watch while you repair this? He says, sure, no problem. And he takes you into the back room and he undoes those special screws of the iPhone and he examines it and he sees what's going on with the circuitry. He reaches onto, a sh onto the shelf and he undoes and begins to pour from a jar of Hellman's mayonnaise into the circuitry of your iPhone. And we look at him, we say, are you crazy? What are you doing? What are you doing to my phone? Mayonnaise in my phone? And he looks at us and rightfully so has all the right in the world to say, sir, you have a problem with what I am doing? I manufactured this phone. I made this phone. I know exactly what's good and what's bad for it. In this circ circumstance, 
Hellman's mayonnaise is a great lubricant. It's going to work wonders and your phone is going to work. Just watch the scene. And he is right. We can't have any questions on what he's doing because there's no one who knows the product better than the manufacturer. Guess what, my friends? Every once in a while, Hashem decides to splash a little mayonnaise into the circuitry of our lives. And although it seems very strange to us, what are you doing? How could it be? Yet, he is the manufacturer and we are the product. And there is no one who knows the product better than the manufacturer. Bitochon gives a person a sense of security, which leads, of course, to happiness. The second ingredient which allows a person to be happy is emuna, belief, belief in Hashem. Belief in Hashem means that we have to accept and believe that Hashem orchestrates and engineers everything that goes on in the world, which means this includes what we refer to as Ashkacha Pratis, which is specific intervention by Hashem. It also includes Hashkacha Kalalis, general intervention. It means that the obvious and the commonplace miracles are from Hashem. There is absolutely nothing that happens without Hashem's orchestration in our modem davening that we say every day in the Shemona Esra, in the Amida. The English translation, well, is uh, your miracles and wonders. What's the difference between a miracle and a wonder? The rabbis use two different words, Nisecha and Niflo Secha. So the Otsa Hatfilos, the book on Otsa Hatfilos, gives, gives a commentary on the Tfila says, very different. You see, Nisecha are the outright miracles, the obvious miracles, the splitting of the sea when a, a bomb drops and it doesn't detonate. That's an obvious miracle. Niflo Secha, the wonder is those are the everyday, seemingly normal, natural things that happen in our lives. The fact that we are breathing natural. How many miracles have to go through the body, the human body, in order for that oxygenated blood to reach all of our organs, allowing us to breathe, speak to people never these days who are having problem breathing. It means that nothing in this world is by coincidence. In fact, going back to language, the Loshon HaKodesh word for coincidence is mikre. Mikre is mem kuf reish he. Many years ago, I heard from a great Sephardic rabbi who said, unscramble the word mikre, and it spells rak me Hashem, only from Hashem. There is nothing be mikre. There is nothing by coincidence. And let's remember, emuna does not mean, as the phrase we all grew up hearing, that seeing is believing. In fact, seeing is not believing. Not seeing is believing. And let me prove it to you. If I were to hold up in front of you, right here, am I watching your hand? And I would say to you, do you believe there's a watch in my hand? Please don't tell me, yes, you believe there's a watch in my hand. You don't believe there's a watch in my hand. And you know there's a watch in my hand. You don't have to believe it. You know it. If I were to lift up my hand like this and say, I, Yachnes, I'm saying to you, there's a watch in my hand. Do you believe it? Well, that depends. If you know me for 25, 35 years and everything I've ever told you came true. If I told you it was going to snow in August in Miami and it snowed in August in Miami and repeatedly everything I ever told you came true, then guess what? You develop a belief in me. And if I say there's a watch in my hand, yes, then you will believe it. So seeing is not believing. Seeing is knowing. Not seeing is believing. I want to share a story that happened to me years ago. I was on an airplane sitting in the aisle seat, and across the aisle was a woman, and she sees my yarmulke, and she says to me, are you Jewish, sir? And I said, yes, I'm Jewish. And she says to me, do you believe in God? I said, yes, I believe in God. Thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be an interesting flight. And she asked me the million-dollar question. She says, did you ever see God? I said, no, I never saw God. So she says, well, how can you believe in something you've never seen? She points to a chair and she says, I believe there's a chair here because I see the chair. I believe that there's a table in front of me here because I see it. You're telling me you believe in God, yet you've never seen God. How do you believe in a God you've never seen? So Hashem put the words in my mouth and I happened to know a bit about aviation. And I said to her, ma'am, I don't want to get you nervous, but guess what? We're flying 30,000 feet in the air. We're not the only airplane up here. There are hundreds of planes up in the sky. 
You ever wonder how we don't meet by accident? You see, down the aisle here in the cockpit, in front of the pilot, there's a console. And on that console, there are beeping lights. Every beeping light, which we refer to as radar, signifies another plane out there. Every pilot looks at those blinking lights and avoids each one of them, so he's avoiding each airplane. And then I said to her, you know, visibility during the day for a pilot is about five miles. At nighttime with the headlights, very, very little, 500 yards perhaps. Planes are traveling 600 miles an hour. I ask you, ma'am, does our pilot see the other planes? And she said, no, of course not. Does he believe they're there? Oh yes, he believes they're there. And you and I and millions of people are flying in airplanes because our pilots are seeing, are believing rather, even though they don't see. So I said, if the pilots can believe in the other planes, even if they don't see them, then I can believe in God, even if I don't see him. Belief that Hashem is in control of everything that happens and nothing is by coincidence helps one obtain happiness. That brings us to ingredient number three, Seichel intellect. It does not mean common sense. The Sefer Chovos Halvavos, duties of the heart, in the chapter Avodos Elohim, that means service to God. He, is, he explains as follows, he says, every human being has what's referred to as a nefesh Bahamas, an animalistic instinct for natural desires. But human beings are endowed with Seichel, which he says is the Neshama HaKadosha, a built-in system that yearns for spirituality, which allows us to rule over our instincts. Let me give you an example. If an animal sees a piece of cake, what does it do? It eats, it eats, it eats, and it will keep eating until it just can't eat anymore. When a human being with the Seichel, with the Neshama, sees a piece of cake, we have the ability to make choices, to make decisions. Should I eat it now? Should I eat it later? Should I eat one piece? Should I eat 10 pieces? Should I make a bracha? Or shouldn't I make a bracha? Should I share it with someone else or not? In other words, in other words, the neshama allows us to make decisions, to make choices. That is the main differentiation between human beings and animals. Animals respond and act by instinct. They do not have a neshama. They do not have that apparatus, which allows them to make choices. Let me share a story that I heard many years ago from Rabbi Binyamin Kamenetsky, the son of Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. He told me that he was walking with his father, Rabbi Yaakov, a nine-year-old boy approached and he asked Rabbi Yaakov a question. He said, Rabbi, I have a question. It's a two-part question. I've asked many people. I haven't gotten an answer yet. Number one, I hear all about the neshama, the neshama, the, the soul. What is the neshama? And secondly, where is the neshama? You take an x-ray, you take an MRI, you see every part of the body. But where is the neshama? Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky said to the young boy, pick up your right hand. He picked up his right hand. Now pick up your left hand. He picked up his left hand. Lift your right foot. He lifted his right foot. And then Rabbi Yaakov said to the boy, without putting down your right foot, lift your left foot. Smart boy, what did he do? He jumped. As soon as he jumped, Yaakov Kamenetsky said, that was your neshama. What do you mean, said the boy. Rabbi Yaakov explained that in order for you to lift your left foot without putting down your right foot, you had to make a choice. You had to make a decision. The decision was to jump. Decision are, decisions are made by the neshama. The neshama is the decision choice making apparatus of a human being. And we are constantly making decisions. Most of them subconsciously. Are we listening now? Are we distracted? Are we sitting? Are we standing? These are all decisions. Ah, that is the neshama. And in order to be happy, a person must feed the source of happiness. You can eat rib steak all week long. It'll feed the body. It'll feed the belly. But happiness comes from the neshama, spirituality. That's why all of these um, Alcoholic Anonymous programs, all the drug programs, what do they focus on? 12-step pro, uh, pro, uh, programs, why? Spirituality, why? Because people are doing what they're doing because they're trying to reach happiness, but they're heading the wrong direction, they're tapping into the wrong sources. 
in order for a person to be happy he has to tap into the source of happiness what is that that is spirituality that is the neshama we have to feed the neshama and let's remember that the neshama is pure every day we say in the morning elokai neshama shenasati bitahorahi it is pure every single day yes sometimes unfortunately we accumulate uh, some dirt on that neshama by things that we do or don't do or act inappropriately say inappropriately but let me share something that was said by the great sculptor michelangelo when he was asked how is it possible that a human being can make such beautiful sculptures and listen to the words that he said he said the sculpture is already in the stone all i do is remove the rubbish brilliant same thing with the neshama the neshama that is pure yes during the day we accumulate rubbish by certain things that we do all we need to do is remove the rubbish and there we are with the pure neshama tahora knowing that we are in control with that neshama we are control our decisions and choices brings us to happiness finally the fourth ingredient to happiness is topless contentment you see unfortunately we have we are we are living in a society that promotes materialism i remember cutting a um an ad out of a newspaper years ago and i still have it and it's a picture of a boat and the caption reads you haven't lived until you've cruised i looked at my wife and i said we must be dead now, is there anything wrong with going on a cruise? Absolutely not. If you're blessed with the affordability to do it, you have the time and you give you a share of stock. Of course, nothing wrong with going on it. But to make a statement, you haven't lived until you've cruised, that is a subtle yet powerful message that I cannot be content unless I've done such and such. Now, please, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, we have to remember that attitude plays a major role in being content with what we have. Let me share with you a thought of the Chidush Harim, the word that the Torah uses to define tzaraas, leprosy in the Torah, is nega, nega tzaraas. The word nega is spelled nun, gimel ayin. Says the Gera Rebbe, if you unscramble those letters and you spell it ayin nun gimel, it spells oneg, a pleasure. It depends where you put the ayin, says the Chidushe Harim. Ayin, the letter Ayin is spelled Ayin Yud Nun, which means the eye. It depends where you put your eye. It depends how you look at it. It depends how we view things. That switches it, transform it, transform it from a nega, an affliction, to oneg, to a pleasure. Remember this phrase, please, this quotation. Change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. I want to share the words of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who said, Ma ani What I lack in bitachon, I make up with contentment. And Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky explained the words of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. If he knew he needed $100 a week to live, for example, but he only had enough of bitachon for $80. He didn't have that much bitachon, he had only $80 worth, but he lacked some of the bitachon for the extra $20. And his tapas, I make it up with his tapas, with I learn how to be content with $80. I end with a fascinating story that happened in our family years ago. Of course, in Miami Beach, you're familiar, they have the annual boat show. In those days, it was by the Fountain Blue Hotel, and I took my family one year. And uh, we were viewing these incredible boats, one after the other, and it struck me, does anybody ever really buy these boats? And I went over to one of the agents, and I asked him, does somebody ever buy these boats? And he reached into his pocket, and he took out a check for $7 million, and he pointed to a boat, and he said, a half hour ago, somebody bought that boat over there, $7 million. And I said, wow, he must have been thrilled to be able to afford a $7 million boat. And the agent said to me, no, actually, he was miserable. He was cursing under his breath because he realized that he didn't have enough cash flow. He really wanted that boat. He wanted another boat that he pointed to, and that was $15 million. So he had to settle for the $7 million boat. He talked about contentment. He's able to afford a $7 million boat, yet he is not happy. By the way, just for the record, 
I asked him, those boats look the same to me. What's the difference between the two? Excuse the humor, but he's saying in a $15 million boat, there are seven bathrooms and each one has a 24 carat solid gold toilet flusher. Now I ask you, my friends, does it make a difference what it's made out of plastic metal? 24 karat gold toilet flushes. I don't play cards, but I guess that's what you call a royal flush. But guess what? Being content brings a person to happiness. Those are the four ingredients, bitachon, emuna, trust in Hashem, belief in Hashem, seichel, shoma at work, and of course, his tapkos. I want to end with a tefillah. The Navi said, Behold, I am bringing days and I will send a row of a famine of the land. It won't be a famine for bread or thirst for water. Rather, will be a hungry thirst to hear the words of Hashem. Think of the days we are in now. There's no lack of food and water. You go to the stores that's still selling. But what don't we have? The Shmoaz, Dibre Hashem, our shuls are closed. Our Bate Medrashos, the Kolels, the base Medrashos are closed. Kiyim, the Shmoaz, Dibre Hashem. My friends, and may we be Zolcha in good health to go back to shul, go back to Kolel, to go back to the yeshiva. And may we all speedily in the very near future be healthy and take, having our needs taken care of in Mitzvah Hashem and be greeted in time for Pesach, if that long, by Mashiach Tzidkenu Bimhera Biyameinu. Thank you for joining. On uh, behalf of Magen David Surfside and Rabbi Koskas, I just want to again express our thank you to Rabbi Yachnis for giving us his time and sharing his beautiful words of Chizuk. We hope in the merit of the Torah and Musar shared, tonight, uh, shared with us tonight by Rabbi Yachnis that we see Yeshua from Hashem, and we'd like to wish Rifua uh, Shlema to all Chole Israel. May all those who need it see a speedy and full recovery. Amen.